Good morning, ladies and gentlemen across the state of California. This is the California High Speed Rail Authority Board meeting for August the 13th of 2020. Welcome. Before we start today, I'd like to ask Mo to give those of you uh, in the audience uh, some information with regards to how this meeting operates. Mo, if you'd uh, take over, please. Good morning. Welcome to the California High Speed Rail Board of Directors meeting. Today, we are hosting this meeting via Zoom. In a moment, we will take public comment. Instructions for public comment by Zoom. If you are logged into this meeting via Zoom, please use the raise your hand feature typically located at the bottom of your screen so that I can call on you to provide your comment. Public comment by phone instructions. If you're dialing in by phone, pressing star nine will raise your hand and put you into our queue. Speakers will be called in the order that their hand is raised. Once you've been in the queue and your name is called in the web meeting, please click the prompt on your screen to allow your microphone to be unmuted. On the phone, we will call on you by the last four digits of your phone number. At that point, you'll hear a message that you are being unmuted. Once unmuted, it will be your turn to speak. Please slowly and clearly say and spell your first and last name, and if applicable, state the organization you represent. After your introduction, each speaker is allotted two minutes to provide comments. Our court reporter is on the line to record those comments. If they need you to spell or repeat something, they may interject. You will hear a timer beeping once you get over two minutes. At the end of your comment, we will disable your microphone. However, you are welcome to stay on the line to continue watching or listening to the meeting. If you do not wish to provide comment and simply want to watch the meeting, you can do so by logging on to hsr.ca.gov and looking for the link to our live stream. And I also will be going over these instructions one more time prior to public comment. And that is the instructions, Vice Chair Richards. Great, thank you, Mo. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the board members also join you from around the state of California, from pretty much all four corners of California. And uh, before we uh, bring the meeting to order, if we can, um, if you can bring the flag up and we'll uh, have the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. And follow for me, please. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the, the flag, flag of the United, the United States, States of America, America. and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, if we can now call the meeting to order and if the secretary will call the roll. Good morning, Director Fink. Present. Vice Chair Richards. Here. Director Camacho. Here. Director Miller. Here. Senator Bell. Assembly Member Arambula. Assembly Member Arambula. Director Perea. Here. Director Gelmetti. Present. Director Escutia. Here. Director Boutros. Present. Vice Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you very much and thank uh, all of our colleagues for being here today. Uh, we will now go to a public comment and Mo will ask you to uh, coordinate the public comment as you have in the last couple of meetings. So uh, we'll turn it back over to you for public comment. Right, so for public comment, we have two people with their hands raised. We have a Cindy Bloom and a David Schwagel. Hi, this is Cindy Bloom. May I speak? Yes, thank you. Good morning, Cindy. Hi, how are you guys doing? Hey, um, so this is Cindy Bloom. I live in Los Angeles and I I'm just, my, my remarks will be rather short. Um, I just really think this project needs to go away. Um, the budgets go up exponentially, well, not exponentially, but they go up billions and billions every business plan. It's now at $98 billion. Um, and the, the latest um, article by Ralph Artemedian about this uh, bridge failure is just, you know, the latest in a long stream of debacles plaguing this project and I don't have to tell you that the state of California's budget is an absolute shambles 
And, you know, every dollar is precious. And I think that the, these dollars should be reserved for essential services in California, not this high speed train. You know, I know that, that a lot of work has already gone into it, maybe finish up what you started, but this would be a perfect time to just uh, stop the project from moving forward. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. David Schwegel. Yes, this is David Schwegel. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Welcome. Good morning. This is David, D-A-V-I-D, Schwegel, S-C-H-W-E-G-E-L, with Apex, E-X, Civil Engineering in Clovis. I had a great discussion with Stanley Forsek of the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Three talking points. First, Alexander Hamilton started a National Infrastructure Bank, John Quincy Adams, Abraham Lincoln, and Franklin D. Roosevelt carried on the legacy. However, starting in the 1960s, the U.S. lost focus while the rest of the industrialized world put the pedal to the metal. Now that we are here in 2020, we want to keep an eye on the Democratic National Convention next week and H.R. 6422, which is going through the House of Representatives right now. This would help get the U.S. back on track through a national infrastructure bank leveraging a $4 trillion investment in infrastructure. Now, I realize that putting together mega projects like this is challenging. I invite all of us to really make this national infrastructure bank work, showcase this project as a model for the rest of the nation to follow, and finally revisit the board meeting from April 2012, to really reinforce why we're here. Thank you. Thank you, David. Anybody else, Mo? Yep, we have a uh, Tilo Cortez, and then we have a Roland LeBron, and then a Ronnie Rudolph after him. Okay. Mr. Cortez? Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. we hear you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Tilo Cortez. I'm the mayor for the city of Wasco, and I have some comments for uh, the board here. Um, the city of Wasco has been engaged with high speed rail project for the better part of the last decade. I speak to you with a heavy heart and frustration over the authorities' actions and treatment of my community. The authorities staff believes that they are being good partners. Given where things stand now, the statement could be further from the truth. Not taking into account the devastating impacts to, to businesses and residential properties along the project's alignment, Wasco was further burdened by the socio-economic costs the project is having on our city, which the authority has refused to address. An immediate critical issue that has risen to the forefront is the future and current condition of the former Wasco Farm Labor Housing Complex. The former Farm Labor Housing Complex is adjacent to the project's alignment in Wasco, the now vacant complex spans 23 acres and has over 220 residential units that pose immediate threats to the city's public safety and quality of life is the textbook definition of neighborhood blight. According to the authority's 2012 environmental justice guidance, the authority's duties under its environmental justice the authority has a continuing duty to review, analyze, and mitigate its effects on communities throughout the scope of its work. The City Council formally requested a May 5th, 2020 letter to the authority's regional director that the authority mitigate the condition of the former farm labor housing complex by demolishing and clearing the site. In meetings and discussions with the authority's representative, the city was repeatedly assured that any adverse effects as a consequence of the authority or the project would be reviewed and construction package four, which includes a segment in Washington, has had 59 change orders for over $132 million. We all understand this project has gone has not gone as planned and must adapt to unforeseen issues. The same applies to the authority's mitigation measures if they lead to new unforeseen issues. Just as the authority has done with executing change orders, the authority needs to address the new condition their mitigation measures have created. 
The city has several serious concerns with the impacts of the project and how it's being managed, including the current lack of oversight in the design process and the loss of direct Amtrak services to our residents. This past January, our city staff raised concerns to the city over its contractors' inappropriate use of an engineer's credentials and was no longer involved in the project. There were also questions regarding who, were the, who was the contractor's engineer of record or who was the contractor's engineer stamping the plans. There were instances where the contractor staff that were working on engineering aspects of the project were operating out of the country and impeding the city staff's ability to engage directly with them on the project. The high-speed rail project was not something the city of Wasco or its residents asked for. It was imposed on us by the powers that be. We have had concerns since day one and were consistently reassured that our disadvantaged community would be better off because of it. Joe Hedges, COO of California Rail Builders, once stated in a meeting, we should be happy because HSR is making investments to infrastructure in our community. Investments? These are not investments. These are mitigation measures for the path of destruction this tornado of a project is leaving behind in our peaceful city of Wasco. If HSR cannot keep its promises to the city of Wasco, how does it expect to keep its promises to the taxpayers who are funding this project? The city has set up a webpage to document the challenges our community faces and instances the authority has failed to live up to its own environmental justice guidance. I would be happy to discuss these issues further with authority board members at the earliest possible opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we've had a, a long relationship, as you've noted, with uh, with Wasco, and uh, it's obviously troubling for us to hear uh, your comments. However, we appreciate them. And what uh, I will ask uh, right now is that uh, uh, somebody from Brian Kelly's office or he, Brian himself to contact your office uh, to set up a meeting with uh, members of your uh, staff hopefully yourself as well as uh, Brian and whoever else he would like to uh, have as a part of that team, but to start going through uh, the uh, items that you pointed out uh, step by step and work towards two things. One, a resolution and two, uh, a commitment to, that the authority keeps its word on what it's made uh, in terms of its commitments. So thank you very much for, for uh, speaking to us today and we'll be in touch with you shortly. Okay, Mo. All right, next we have a Roland LeBron. Okay. Good morning, Vice Chair Richard, board members. This is Roland LeBron, San Jose. Thank you for the opportunity. I'd like to touch on two quick items this morning. First, I would like to inform you that the requirement for members of the public to pre-register to address this body constitutes a violation of government code section 54953.3. I will repeat, 54953.3. The second item is more serious and relates to July 1st, 2019 letter from the FRA to Governor Newsom, which granted deeper assignment to the authority, spe specifically section four, which deals with certifications and acceptance of jurisdictions, and in particular, section 4.2.3, which concludes with the following sentence. If the state is unable to obtain adequate organization and staff capability, the state will inform FRA and the MOU will be amended to assign only the responsibilities that are commensurate with the available organizational and sta staff capability as determined appropriate by the FRA. In closing, I'd like to give you a couple of examples of why this is a significant issue. First, Network Rail have no high-speed rail expertise whatsoever, other than the operation and maintenance contract for the Channel Tunnel Rail Link, which is now known as HS1, high-speed one, which coincidentally was designed, built, and financed by the very same Bechtel Arab and Sister Consortium that the authority rejected at the June 2015 board meeting in favor of Parsons Brinkerhoff. And you, and you will be hearing more next month about emerging issues with net, network rails oversight of Caltrain electrification and signaling issues at great uh, crossings in particular. And last but not least, 
I once asked a gentleman who will be giving the Central Valley Y presentation if he had any high-speed rail experience whatsoever. And, in his, and his answer was, yes, this one, which was the correct answer because I actually had invested two minutes looking up his bio on LinkedIn, on LinkedIn before asking the question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LeBrun. Anybody else, Mo? Yep, we have one more, a Ronnie Rudolph. Mr. Rudolph? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, welcome. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm calling uh, today basically in regards to the Burbank to our Los Angeles to Burbank area. Um, we, I, and along with many other people, were very vocal about the public comment period not being long enough. Um, and being in a very inopportune time where there's a number of things that are going on in the world right now or just in our area that are more important than worrying about the public comment period for high-speed rail, in which we feel or I feel that this is kind of trying just to get swept under the rug and get rubber stamped without people realizing because they're more worried about saving their jobs, their businesses, their health with COVID and so forth. Um, I do know that it got extended until August. Um, I personally didn't get that postcard until yesterday. So that is already more than a week in to that four weeks that got extended essentially. Um, another thing I would like to ask is, I haven't seen anything done over even the first 12, 13 days of this month that even shows why it was extended. Other than that, it just got extended. If you're, if there, I wanna see, or if there's some type of a, uh, document public document that shows what the plan was for these 30 days other than just mailing out a postcard posting some stuff online and saying we're extending the public comment period i believe the whole point of that public comment period to be extended is to do more community outreach to do more things obviously COVID hasn't gone away it's not going away anytime soon um and until that goes away people are still going to be worried about their jobs worried about their businesses worried about you know the health and that all comes before worrying about a public comment period for this and i feel like it's just let's rubber stamp it move it on and, and we'll worry about the rest later well i don't think that's fair not only to the community but to the state and a number a whole host of other things um i truly feel this needs to be pushed way beyond the pandemic as far as public comment so people really have an understanding and can go to these places my only option is for people to go downtown for people of low income, people who don't speak English, I highly doubt there's anything that has reached out to Spanish speaking newspapers, Spanish speaking television, anything of the sort. So I just want to reiterate that there needs to be better outreach. I was promised that there would be more outreach. I haven't seen anything. Somebody called me like the last week of July and said, oh, we're gonna do some stuff in this area. Nothing's happened. It's been two weeks since that call. So uh, please take that into consideration and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ruda. So I believe that uh, concludes the uh, public comment. Correct. All right, thank you, Mo. We'll move uh, now into our agenda. Item number one for today's agenda is the, uh, the action on the board uh, minutes from last meeting. If there are no uh, requests for changes, additions, deletions, do we have a motion for approval? So moved, this is Lynn. Second. We have a motion and second. Uh, uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Director Schenck? Yes. Vice Chair Richards? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Director Miller? Yes. Director Perea? Director Perea? Director Perea? Yes. Can you hear me, Justin? Correct. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Director Gilmetti? Director Gilmetti? Yes. yes. Director Escutia? Yes. Director Boutros? Yes. <clears throat> Motion carries. 
Thank you. Item uh, items two, three, and four, as, uh, as my colleagues have noted, are all information items. We have no action items in today's um, agenda. So moving on to item number two is the Central Valley Y <laughs> certification update. Um, Mark, and I'm, uh, I'm not sure who's uh, delivering this today. Uh, good morning, uh, Vice Chair Richards and board members. This is Mark McLaughlin. I'm the Director of Environmental Services for the Authority. And then uh, Gary Kenner, introduced Gary Kennerly. He's the Director of Projects for Northern California and also Central Valley. <clears throat> um, I'd like to acknowledge Gary and also previous Regional Director Diana Gomez on all the work that's been done with stakeholders in the Valley, <clears throat> especially on this segment. It's been um, years in the making, if you will, coordinating with Madera, City of Chowchilla, uh, the Farm Bureaus, Merced and Madera, and uh, definitely with the uh, Fairmead community. So there's a lot of good work that's been done, um, a lot of land stakeholders in that area, and I think we've come to a place of, of agreement. So um, with that, uh, Justin, next slide. Um, so for today, um, we're going to provide you, as, as uh, Tom said, uh, briefing information on the process of the steps involved for us for the CBY final EIR EIS. And um, again, to brief the board on the contents and no action is required uh, today. Hey, Mark. Yes. Brian Kelly, I just want to mm -hmm. weigh in here for the board members uh, as a reminder. Sure. I know we've uh, briefed on some of this, uh, but again, this is uh, a presentation that really tee ups, uh, tees up our longer conversation at the September hearing. And I just wanted to uh, set the context for this a little bit today, that um, this is uh, the second rod uh, coming to the board uh, in the last 12 months, uh, next month, for the Central Valley Y uh, stretch of this. This is the area of Northern Central Valley uh, between Madera and Merced and going uh, westward toward uh, Gilroy. Um, uh, as we've noted to the board members in letters, and we'll have a lengthy hearing in September uh, to go through the environmental documents. The board will have uh, to consider the adoption of that document. And uh, what we're the reason this is an informational item today is it will be an action item at the September hearing, but we're just uh, using today to uh, tee up the conversation about where we are on this. And uh, we'll, we'll come with uh, uh, obviously a longer hearing, more substantive, uh, a presentation and uh, an action before the board uh, to adopt adopt this rod at the September hearing. So, uh, Mark, forgive me. I just wanted to uh, present that context. And with that, please go ahead. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Brian. Um, next slide, Justin. So, um, for a little bit of history here on the map, the Central Valley Y is part of the Merced Fresno section, and um, we also identified in that EIR EIS, the hybrid alternative as our preferred alternative for the north-south alignment of that, of that document. Um, we also, during that period of time in the hybrid selection, the Merced and Fresno stations were, were uh, considered and adopted. The final EIR, EIR EIS for the Merced Fresno document was done in May of 2012. And then the FRA rod on the NEPA uh, context was filed in September of 2012, and then uh, Surface Transportation Board Rod was filed in April of 2013, which paved the way for the beginning of construction in the Central Valley on Merced Fresno CP1. <clears throat> so these approvals deferred a decision in the Y connection or Y box, as you see on the map area, um, for initial environmental analysis and working with the stakeholders in the community on an alignment through that area that was workable for the stakeholders. We analyzed several uh, Y alternatives and um, the limits of the box here uh, for your information is Ranch Road to the north, uh, Road 19 into the south, and Carlucci Road uh, to the west. So that's the context of the Y as the critical piece in the uh, east-west and north-south connections for the project. Gary, uh, next slide for, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Mark. This is Gary Kennelly, uh, Northern California Director of Projects. Um, so what is shown here is the extent of the Central Valley Y. Uh, it totals about 51 miles uh, and generally parallels the main transportation corridors in the area. Uh, East-West, that's State Route 152, 
and then north south uh, state route 99 and also the union pacific railroad right of way uh, since this is a supplemental to the Merced to Fresno document, uh, the supplemental itself doesn't actually include any stations, uh, but would ultimately uh, be part of the connection between Fresno and Merced stations. Um, the, the area is generally rural in nature, um, but the alignment is adjacent to the city of Chowchilla, so located in the center of the screen, and also passes close to the community of Fermid, uh, which is to sort of the southeast uh, as we approach uh, Madeira. Um, so as Mark noted, this is supplemental, is part of the Merced to Fresno project section. Uh, overall, in the document, we have closely uh, analyzed four alternatives uh, presented here. Uh, and the preferred alternative is the alignment shown in green, uh, State Route 152 to Road 11. Uh, and the reasons that was selected as a preferred alternative was overall a balance of the impact to the natural environment and community resources. And that was based on both uh, environmental regulatory requirements and also extensive stakeholder outreach and preference. Um, the preferred alternative has fewer impacts on the natural environment and the community resources compared to the other three alternatives. And it also achieves uh, one of the main goals of maintaining close proximity to the existing transportation corridors. Next slide, please. Uh, so the Central Valley Y, uh, it actually has had three circulations for public review. Uh, initially, we circulated the document under the California uh, Environmental Quality Act in May of 2019. Um, we had an open house in the community of Fermid, followed by a public hearing in the uh, city of Chowchilla. Uh, following the uh, assignment of NEPA responsibility to the authority in July of 2019, we then recirculated the same document out to the public for the NEPA circulation period. Uh, this was from September to October. And again, we held a public hearing in the city of Chowchilla. And then uh, following the uh, preparation of the draft document, uh, there was an additional candidate species, the crotch bumblebee, uh, was identified uh, under the California uh, Environmental, uh, sorry, Endangered Species Act as a candidate species. And so in March of this year, we recirculated a limited uh, recirculation of the document that focused on the biological uh, impacts. And that was completed in April of 2020. And due to the limited nature of that recirculation, no public uh, hearing was held. Uh, overall, we received 82 submissions, uh, which resulted in a total of 300, sorry, 731 comments. Uh, and many of these were repeated because of the document being circulated twice. Uh, and so similar comments were repeated. Um, those comments have now been addressed and the draft document updated to reflect input uh, and that has resulted in the circulation of the final supplemental environmental impact report impact statement um, on friday august the 7th and that is now available on the authority's website um, for a 30-day availability period uh, it is also available in hard copy at the authority's sacramento and fresno offices Next slide, please. Uh, in addition to uh, preparing the final document, as Mark noted, we have continued our extensive outreach uh, with the community. Um, several of the key um, agencies are noted here. Uh, with Madeira County, we've had ongoing discussions and currently very much focused on uh, meeting requirements of environmental justice mitigations mentioned or committed to in the environmental document, uh, which includes the provision of a community center uh, for the community of Fermi to maintain their community. Uh, similarly, we have been working closely with the city of Chowchilla on providing a permanent sewer connection to the community of Fermi, again, to maintain uh, the viability of that community. And we've had many ongoing meetings with the community of Fermi itself uh, to make sure that we address the impact to that community is an environmental justice community and the goal is to make sure we leave that community better than uh, better than before uh, in addition we have had um, 
several meetings with the Chowchilla Elementary School District. Uh, they have a elementary school located in Fairmead and several other schools in the city of Chowchilla. They are unique in that they um, assign their students to schools based on grade level. And so they bus all of their student body to the various schools depending on their grade level, resulting in a very extensive uh, network of bus routes. And we are working with them closely to assess the impact that the project may have on this, but those bus routes and to make sure that they can maintain their necessary transportation requirements. Along with that, we have also been meeting regularly with the farm bureaus and other stakeholders uh, to provide uh, project updates and address issues as they've been raised. And we've also had several meetings with a, a group that are called the Madeira County Task Force. Uh, this consists of the Mid County of Madeira, the City of Chowchilla, the City of Madeira, uh, Madeira County Transportation Commission, and the Madeira Unified School District, as well as the Madeira Economic Development Commission. And we've had several meetings with them regarding their comments on the document and also to keep them up to speed on where we are with the project. Next slide, please. Um, so moving on to uh, what's coming up next. Uh, as I mentioned, the final supplemental environmental document was released on August 7th. Um, it will be available for 30 days, which is required under NEPA requirements. Uh, that it period is completed on September 8th. And then that will set us up for presenting the project to the board at the September 10th meeting. Uh, for project approval uh, and actions. Um, so at the board meeting, um, we'll be looking for the board. We will, there will be a presentation on the final document, uh, and then we'll be looking for the board to take the necessary actions, which include certifying the final supplemental environmental document as a CEQA lead agency, uh, also approving the preferred alternative and completing other related CEQA decision documents, and also looking for direction from the board to the authority CEO to sign a supplemental record of decision under the authority's NEPA assignment. And with that, that concludes the presentation and be happy to answer any questions directors may have. Uh, are there any questions for Gary or for uh, Mark from members of the board? Hearing none, Brian, do you have uh, anything to conclude uh, this item? Yes, Tom. Um, uh, again, just this was the sort of early briefing for right. uh, what we're heading into for September. Uh, there will be additional briefings for uh, board members as we get toward the uh, uh, September hearing on uh, uh, all that will be before the, the body. We will take a public comment uh, at that hearing and uh, I suspect, expect the September hearing will be a bit lengthy to work not just through this, but to uh, get through other items that will be on that agenda. I'm expecting a very substantive uh, September. Okay. Thank you, Brian. And uh, um, uh, this is Lynn. May yes, I hi, make Lynn, a comment? Th thank you uh, for the, the edification of the public. Uh, they shouldn't think that because there are no questions at this time, that we haven't individually been involved and in discussing with staff and having our uh, very probing questions answered up to this point. So nothing should be read into it that we're not asking questions again, repeating the same questions during this hearing. Thank you, Lynn, that's a very good point. And uh, as many uh, of you around the, the dais and probably all of you have been involved in this process before you'll uh, quite clearly have very tired eyes by the time we get to the, uh, September the 10th. So very good point. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, if there are no other uh, questions, thank both of you gentlemen again, and we'll move on to uh, thank our you. next item on the agenda, which is a, uh, a summary of today's finance and audit committee. And I'll uh, just go through a few points that I think would be of interest that we'd like to pass on to you for the 2021 um, and, and that by the way that meeting occurred this morning at 8 30. Um, for our 2021 fiscal year um, what we have an additional 85 positions uh, to be filled uh, at the authority and this is in part with our increasing state employees uh, in the authority uh, while at the same time reducing the cost 
of consultants. Um, the net effect uh, by the estimates of our CFO is this will generate about an $18 million savings in the 2021 fiscal year. Uh, with regards to our capital outlay expenditures, our, our budget includes construction, uh, project development, and bookends. Uh, the bookends are local uh, initiatives, uh, lo local projects that the authority supports finan financially. Um, where we ended up at the end of the fiscal year, which this reporting information I'm giving you is really for the period ending June 30th to so the end of that of the fiscal year 1920. Um, the budget uh, was two billion two hundred and fifty-five million. We actually expended uh, roughly one point five billion, which was sixty-six percent of the budget. Um, that, by contrast or comparison, is about a fifty percent increase over the spending in the uh, previous year. I mean, excuse me, previous fiscal year. The total project expenditures in this project from the outset are now at about 7.2 billion, of which 77% uh, of that is construction. Uh, project development is 17% and 3% each for administration and local assistance projects. With regards to, as you're well aware on our ARA uh, grant, we have an obligation, uh, the state has an obligation to match. Um, the match requirement is to 2 billion 495 or 96 million. Uh, to date, uh, we have, um, as everybody's aware, and without belaboring it, uh, there has not been any active communication with FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration, for over a year now. Uh, the process continues to move, move forward on our, our side. Um, we have, uh, in combination with what's already been approved by FRA, which uh, what is pending at FRA and what we have that will be forwarded to FRA within a, the next 90 days, it equates to about 84% of the requirement of our match, which is $2.061 billion that will have been forwarded to FRA for the match. Our small business utilization rate has been pretty flat for several months, and I've expressed before our concern about that, recognizing that we've always uh, been of the mind and been told, and, and logically so, I believe that uh, we would see in increases as construction ramps up. Uh, we're sitting right now at 21.3, that's two, uh, two tenths of a percent above where it was the, the month before. Um, I would also tell you that uh, with regards to the forecast that we pass along to you and that you read uh, in information provided for you starting next month, the information that you will be looking at will be based upon the re-baseline schedules that uh, our COO uh, Joe Hedges and his staff have been working on. So we will see in all of our F&A uh, schedules uh, and pro formas for next month and forecast, everything will be predicated on the re-baseline schedules. In construction uh, in the month of June, there were $69 million in invoices that were uh, forwarded to the authority for payment. That compares with $61 million the month before. Uh, and a substantial increase uh, over the previous year, as you would imagine. Um, labor on the sites is, a, is an indicator of, of certainly of pro progress. In the month of June, we averaged 886 uh, workers on sites, on our construction sites, which was an increase of 43 from the month before. And by comparison, we are currently running at about 1,100 workers a day on our projects. Uh, just for information, and you're, uh, you're noting the implications of COVID-19, we've had four positives, this was through June, four positive tests, Two each on uh, CP two and three, or two three, and on CP four. So a total of four. There were 16 workers who were quarantined. In terms of construction, we have in the guideway we've got 78 of 119 miles uh, in construction, and in structures we've got either completed or under construction 43 
of 93 uh, structures in CPs one through four. For, for a row, 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 a right of way, uh, it was a very good month in June. We delivered 25 parcels to the design builders. We acquired an additional 49 parcels during the month of June. Uh, we've delivered 1,623 of 2,353 parcels needed for the completion of CPs one through four. We are down to only eight uh, remaining third party agreements that uh, it's through the end of June that had not been executed. Uh, two were executed during the month of June. And with regards to uh, activity uh, in the environmental uh, areas of the project uh, in follow keeping and following with what you just heard from uh, the uh, our two representatives for the uh, Central Valley Y. Uh, during the course of 2020, uh, the authority has uh, issued three draft EIR EISs, uh, one to Bakers for Bakersfield Merced, a second San Jose to Merced, or excuse me, Bakersfield to Palmdale, a second for San Jose to Merced, and a third Burbank to Los Angeles. Uh, I know that we were scheduled in late June for San Francisco, San Jose, and I believe it was issued, but I don't want to state that. Brian, can you confirm that? Yes, Tom, uh, that was issued uh, publicly on July 10th. Okay, so that was actually ahead of the, uh, the estimate for June, the, June the, or July the 20th. So with that, that, uh, that brings you up to, uh, up to date on specific items that I thought would be important for you to know with regards to today's uh, finance and audit meeting. Are there any questions? Mr. Chairman, I have a couple of questions. Oh, go ahead. Oh, just one very quick question, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Perea. The question that I have was what you mentioned about the use of small business being very, being flat. Um, can you tell us why that is? And then second of all, what is the status of hiring uh, minority and women-owned businesses in this project also. And finally, I guess in order to really increase the numbers for whether it's small business or minority-owned or women-owned business, it all comes down to outreach. And I was just wondering what efforts the authority was making with regard to outreach in order to encourage these um, providers to participate in this. We all know that small business is usually the the, the, the largest uh, net generator of new jobs in the economy. So this is a, a, a really, really big issue. And I'm just hoping that the, that the authority is going to take positive steps to, to cure that defect. Thank you, Martha. Th those are all good questions. And ones that we, um, th those who've been around on the board for some period of time, Lynn was a real leader in, in uh, the move towards uh, setting this aspirational goal of 30% of, uh, of the work done for the authority to be uh, accomplished by small business and minority owned business and uh, uh, disabled veterans business. Um, the, we've always, we've always uh, recognized that, um, that in some areas it's perhaps more difficult in some of the cons consulting businesses Although I think we've, we've been reasonably successful and I think it's been in the neighborhood of about 20%. Again, it's the aspirational goal was 30%, but in our minds, we always thought 30% is really a fair, a, a fair state, a fair number that we should be shooting for and actually should be able to achieve. We, always, uh, we believe that the achievement of moving it up towards the 30% is gonna be enhanced by more workers on, on, uh, on the actual construction sites. Um, it's, we're looking into it, and because we've raised this in f &A several times, um, we've stayed reasonably flat in the neighborhood of around 21%. Um, when I start seeing you know, the number of workers at 1,100 workers on a job, on, an average, on the jobs average per day, um, my, my sense is we should be seeing more minor, minority owned businesses participating. Um, so it's not something, it's not something, it's something that is really at a, at a, uh, a key apex for us. I think that we, we need to see improvement 
beyond the 21%. Um, Joe is very aware of that. Uh, I know that in the procurements, it, the procurement documents identify what we are, what our, our goal is at 30% and require uh, that those contracts that are left that the, the organizations um, are working towards accomplishing that. Um, I'm not gonna suggest we can't do a better job, Martha. I, I would say to you this, that FNA is looking into what it is that we can do to, to we can ramp up the, the numbers beyond the 21%. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one follow up. The, sure. the unions also have an obligation to ensure that that the workers that they're providing are also you know as diverse as possible and, and diverse not only in terms of uh, race or ethnicity or gender but also diverse in terms of experience you know for example you know former felons you know could be you know used you know to work in these projects and I speak from experience because we did that with USC when we were building our village uh, we actually hired uh, former felons by working with a nonprofit. And it really pleases me to say that they were the best workers. Not only were they trained by the unions, they did the job on the village and they finished it up and they went to go work at, at the Coliseum. So the training that these people are receiving are, is training that they can use in other projects. And I think that the unions are critical to have as partners to ensure that that type of identification of potential worker, training them and then placing them in the projects is critical. Martha, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I can tell you that certainly uh, down here in the Central Valley where the construction is ongoing, the relationship between the authority and the unions has been has been uh, very strong and very and, and very uh, proactive in terms of working together. Cohorts that have been put together uh, with members in those cohorts, just as uh, just as you've described. Have uh, have successfully moved through through the cohorts and have been and they have been placed in jobs. Um, you always just think in these areas. There's always got to be something that you can do better, and the only way that we can judge that is by watching watching those numbers go up as opposed to be down in the low 20s as they are now. But um, the unions have been very very effectively involved with us and continue to be as well as the workforce uh, development organizations in the communities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Martha. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I'll just to add to Martha's sure. uh, question. I think as we move further south or further north, where we'll get into more uh, populated areas, um, that we the opportunities of small minority, women-owned and disabled veteran uh, firms will in fact be able to participate. So okay. it, and we, we're, we're in the rural area, area right now. And, and even though the 21% is great, is good, but I think we can far exceed that. Thank you. Thank you, Ernie. Uh, Martha, just getting back to you for a moment. Let us get together. I think we've got the information anyway. Get together uh, a, 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 a one page uh, summary for you, for the board uh, with regards to the breakdown of the minority businesses that we've currently got on the project. Okay. Any other questions, Henry? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I have three three uh, questions. Just going back to your discussion on, on the revised uh, baseline schedule, mm -hmm. I just wanted to hone in a little bit more on that in terms of uh, an absolute timeline that that will be done and presented to the board. It seems like it's been going on for a while. The other is, uh, an update on in Fresno specifically the Tulare Street and the Shoe Fly, where we are actually at in terms of having that cleared and, and built out. And the third just ties to subcontractors and and the payment uh, of their invoices. Uh, I, I noticed on our bill we, we take pride in in being timely and paying our primes, but I believe we continue to have problems. Uh, not us, but I mean, our primes paying their subcontractors in a timely manner. And I've, I've worked with staff and I think they're doing a great job in, in trying to find some different ways to, to accelerate that. But I think we really have to do a lot better in making sure that they are paid in a timely manner. So I, I don't know uh, 
I, I know the FNA reports on what we do with the primes, but I'm just wondering if, how somehow we can just hold ourselves a little more accountable to the subs that are out there because they don't have the cash flow that some of these bigger firms have to carry their, uh, their employees. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Henry. We'll get back to you on those. And, and with regards to the, the last one, we certainly got involved from time to time when we've been approached by, uh, by subs with regards to not being paid timely. I think we've been helpful. We've got, we've, we've got so many things that we are able to do legally and others that we're not, but um, certainly it, it, I, you know, if, if you are hearing of any subs, uh, you know, forwarding that information to, uh, to management is helpful. And uh, yep. we, do, we do what we can. Um, and I, again, I think we've been reasonably effective at, at uh, doing so. Um, I'll, you know, uh, we'll get some information to you on the uh, on Tulare and the shoe fly. I don't have it off the top of my head, but we'll we'll ask uh, the COO to uh, to forward that to you. And you. Uh, on the revised schedule, I, I think that what we're going to see, uh, and this is all. Uh, this is all in, in the final stages of the of process, but we'll, we'll at least we're going to see the implications of the revised schedule in our F&A uh, package next month. And um, I think we'll have more that we, we, we can at least see what the imp impacts and implications of the revised schedule is on that. And we'll discuss that uh, at F&A next, uh, next month and report out to the uh, board um uh in this in this report during the board next month thank you mr chairman thank you any other questions thank you uh colleagues for those and uh, we'll now move on to the ceo's reports apologies uh, vice chair richards it seems like we do have a member of the public with their hand raised for public comment oh okay then why don't we do that right now so uh, how many do you have mo just one a troy troy hightower Okay, fine, sure, I ask Mr. Hightower to join us. Mr. Hightower? Good morning, Chair Richard. Good morning, welcome. I'd like to make a comment um, in support of the Central Valley Status Report that um, my understanding is put out by the Finance Committee. So I wanna express appreciation for that. Um, we, as you know, I'm based down here in the southern part of the Central Valley. We're now putting out a newsletter that focuses on this region. And that Central Valley report is one of the things that, among other things we get from you that we're putting in the newsletter. So I just want to express that, that appreciation for that report. Thank you very much. And thanks for your comment. Anybody else, Mo? Nope, that's it at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kelly, you're up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, we'll come back with um, additional information for uh, uh, members on the small business uh, participation uh, right. numbers. We'll just give you some raw, raw data. We now have 560 certified small business firms on the project. 180 of those are disadvantaged uh, uh, business enterprises. Uh, and about 60 of those are dis, uh, disabled veteran uh, business enterprises. So that, that's where we stand in raw numbers, but again, thank you. Uh, go through uh, more things as we go forward. Uh, I did want to provide uh, through the CEO report an update on several uh, fronts uh, for the board. And then I'm of course happy to answer any questions. Um, in this, I will roll through uh, update on a couple of things, a uh, change we've made to a uh, a preferred alternative adjustment, uh, some uh, activities that we've concluded or are working on in the program. And then finally, a look ahead to the September hearing. So I will roll through this relatively quickly, um, and then I'm happy to happy to take any any questions. Uh, the first is an update on the LA Union Station uh, uh, funding program. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, bring to the, remind the members where we were on this and how it's advanced, and then what the latest sort of uh, development is, and that is that uh, at our April meeting, uh, the board did approve the funding plan uh, for the LA Union Station Project Phase A, referred to as Link US. Uh, that plan uh, directed $423.3 million in Prop 1A bond funds uh, to that project, and the Phase A budget's about $950 million. Uh, pursuant to the requirements of 1A, 
and subsequent to the board action, the authority forwarded the funding plan to an independent consultant report uh, and to the peer review uh, committee, the legislature and the state director of finance. Uh, in June, both the peer review committee and the joint legislative budget committee sent letters concurring with that funding plan uh, and that it met the requirements of the law to release the Prop 1A uh, bond funds. And then in a letter on July 6th, the director of finance for the state of California, uh, Keely Martin Bosler, uh, formally approved the plan as likely to be successfully implemented and authorized the authority to enter into the commitments to expend that those bond funds. The last step for us with Metro directly is uh, in the coming months, we will develop a project management funding agreement that uh, lays out roles and responsibilities for the management of the project and uh, sort of the, the path for how funding comes available uh, for the for the work. Uh, and so we, we work on that now. We'll bring that uh, also back to the board uh, for approval. Um, uh, LA Metro has requested that we finalize that PMFA by uh, next spring uh, to stay on schedule. And that that is certainly going to be our objective. There is one change to this that's worthwhile to uh, inform the board of, and that is that LA Metro itself is, uh, uh, is, uh, has a slight change to their uh, RFQ for this, uh, this project. Uh, they were uh, using something called construction manager, general contractor approach to uh, procurement. They went out to industry with their approach on this uh, and they had a, a not to exceed price in their uh, their uh, approach and they heard a lot back from industry and others on that and so they're making a shift to still use the CMGC uh, similar to how we did it on the Highway 99 project in the Central Valley uh, but it, I believe they'll be eliminating the not to exceed price element of that. Importantly for the board the project budget is expected to stay the same and of course the authority's funding contribution is capped in our own funding plan and it remains capped uh, for this project. So I just wanted to update the board uh, on the status of the LA Union Station. We did get some approvals underway. Uh, LA Metro is altering the RFQ uh, and um, our commitment to that uh, remains un unaffected or un unchanged. Um, the second element that uh, I'm going to actually pull up a PowerPoint for this uh, part of my CEO report. Uh, I'll jump in that in a minute, but just to preface this a little bit. Uh, not every board member who's here today was here back in November of uh, 2018, but at that time, the board uh, did adopt a preferred alternative uh, for the Palmdale to Burbank section, the 41 mile segment of phase one that's between the Palmdale Transit Center and the Burbank Airport, Airport Station in Southern California. Again, we refer to this as the Palmdale to Burbank uh, segment. That preferred alternative included a direct impact on a body of water uh, near Palmdale known as Una Lake. Uh, and as we've advanced the environmental work, I should say too that this, this segment, the environmental documents for this segment, we have not yet released a draft for this publicly. We will do that in uh, 2021. Uh, but the, uh, the alternative that was adopted by the board had a direct impact on the Una Lake near, near Palmdale. Uh, and as we have advanced the environmental work on this segment and consulted with our federal regulatory agencies, uh, both the United States Army Corps of Engineer and the United States Environmental Protection Agency have made it clear uh, that we must avoid the direct impacts to Una Lake uh, if we are to obtain their federal regulatory assistance uh, toward environmental clearing the segment as we, as we go forward. So therefore, after consultation with our federal partners, uh, the staff has proposed, and I've approved under my delegated authority an amendment to this preferred alternative uh, adopted in 2018 so that we can achieve that objective of avoiding the impacts to Una Lake. And I've got a short PowerPoint I'll just roll through with you all now. And again, I'll be happy to take questions uh, at the end of this. Again, I want to update the board that uh, we've made this, uh, uh, we're proposing to make this change to the, uh, to the uh, alignment uh, after the stakeholder engagement and particularly with our federal partners at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer and uh, U.S. EPA. The alignment is being adjusted to avoid the direct impacts uh, to Una Lake and reduce impacts to the community of Acton, a small community near, uh, uh, near that location. Uh, operational improvements are also gained with the addition uh, of an element here called the track uh, crossover. Um, and again, we've uh, consulted with U.S. Uh, uh, Army Corps, EPA, and Acton uh, on these issues. Uh, next slide. 
this is a map. I, I hope you uh, you guys can see this, but uh, this really reflects the change that we are proposing to make to this alignment on the preferred alternative. That dotted line called refined SR14 is the preferred alternative. And as you look in that area that identifies to the right side of that map, Una Lake and Lake uh, Palmdale, our original refined uh, SR14 was actually touching elements of that Una Lake and directly impacting that waterway uh, through our uh, through our our, uh, our alignment there. And so working again with US uh, uh, Army Corps, US EPA, uh, they encouraged us to push away from that lake, which we are now uh, proposing is what we call SR14A, which now takes a wider turn around the lake coming out of there to avoid uh, those direct uh, direct impacts. I will say that both the northern termination point at the what's called the Palmdale Transit Center and the southern uh, termination point at the Burbank Station Airport are unaffected uh, by this change. But this is a change uh, singularly really to get around uh, Lake. Next slide. Uh, we have talked to uh, community uh, uh, folks about this, uh, this change, including Supervisor Barger's office, uh, Acton Town Council, the town councils for the local communities uh, down there that are impacted by this, as well as uh, local elected officials uh, to date. Um, that's the list of uh, who we've had some engagement with. Uh, generally, it's been uh, viewed as a positive uh, a change to both avoid the lake and uh, also because uh, this also requires us to uh, move uh, what was at grade before near Acton to uh, underground, which the Acton community is supportive of as less impactful uh, to their, their community uh, as, as part of this uh, alignment shift. Next slide. Uh, this, uh, this option is again uh, required by the federal partners, but also has some other benefits. It's the easiest and fastest option for us to construct. It's the uh, lowest constructability risk relating to tunnels and other uh, conditions in the area. Lowest risk of unexpected conditions or circumstances that could impact the cost to build. Um, going forward, fewer traffic and air quality impacts within the communities that surround it during construction. It's the shortest tunneling, uh, and we are committed to tunneling under any alternative underneath the Angeles National Forest and the San Gabriel Mountain National Monument. It's the lowest risk to impacting uh, surface or groundwater and wildlife. And again, most importantly, from our federal regulatory partners, it now avoids the impacts to Una Lake. Uh, the alignment is also, as I mentioned, largely underground through the community of Acton now. Uh, there is a cost impact of this, but I, it's worthwhile to note for the members, this section is currently an unfunded section of the, uh, the, the uh, phase one uh, system. Uh, this 41 mile stretch has been estimated to cost between 17.5 and $18 billion ultimately to get all of this done with the tunneling. And that 17.5 uh, figure it's estimated that there may be a cost impact of this move of about 2%, bumping it up to about 17.8. So that's uh, that's the, the standing of where this is right now. Um, and again, uh, this is uh, uh, sort of the things that uh, uh, we've assessed that we need to do to uh, move forward this environmental document. We're doing it for uh, good reasons from a resources uh, standpoint, uh, from a community uh, impact standpoint in Acton, uh, and clearly, uh, uh, standpoint of helping our uh, uh, work through with our federal regulators uh, the environmental clearance of this this document. Next slide. Uh, just a path forward on next steps here. Again, this is not a segment that we've released a draft environmental document on yet. Uh, we'll do that in uh, 2021. So we will continue stakeholder engagement with other communities, uh, Santa Clarita, uh, resources agency, other uh, communities in that area. Uh, we have to submit to a couple of uh, checkpoints with our federal partners on uh, where we are and determining and agreeing with us that this is the lowest uh, uh, environmental uh, impact uh, alternative as we go forward. Uh, we will uh, conduct a broader agency review. And as you see, we'd circulate the draft EIR EIS. We're scheduled for summer of 2021 with the final uh, coming around the uh, uh, middle to uh, uh, summer elements, uh, parts of uh, 2022. So that is where we- Brian, with the new new members that we have on the board, would you just go ahead and just do a, a quick uh, uh, definition of checkpoint C? I'll do the best I can on that. Um, both checkpoint B and C are 
uh, check-in elements with our mostly with our federal regulatory partners on assuring and helping make determinations uh, that uh, we are presenting an alternative that is the least environmentally damaging preferred alternative or what we call the LEDPA determination. And we work with our federal partners to, uh, to assure that. And so uh, as a very high level general matter, and uh, if uh, anybody wants to correct me, they certainly can. No, no I think that's fine. Those are generally the, the check-in points we have with our federal partner to, to get the concurrence of the federal government that our, our, our regulatory partners that uh, we're having the least impact possible. Okay. Thank you. Uh, unless there's any questions, I'll move on, but I'm happy to take questions on this as well. One quick question. Could yeah. we go back to the slide that showed the um, the graph, or not the graph, the, the uh, um, model the is, yeah, the map, that sort of thing. Where is the um, station and location in relationship to plant 42 in Palmdale? Uh, I missed your 42 part. I'm sorry. Say that again, Ernie. Where, where, where is that station located in relationship to Plant 42? In Air Force. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I'm not exactly certain. That's that that the station location is the subject of conversation that involves uh, not just us, but of course the uh, the city uh, leadership in Palmdale, working with MetroLink, and uh, you know ultimately at some level. Uh, advanced planning that we are will be doing with um, uh, the Brightline train or express train system as they do a high corridor or high desert corridor study to get from Victorville to Palmdale. So I, I don't know if the final final location is uh, entirely settled yet, uh, and I'm not sure the relevance or the relative location to Plan 42. I can get that information for you. I would that. love to have that. The reason I'm asking is sure. there are many. Um, we, my firm, ran the the. Air Force facility for about 10 or 12 years, but there are many people coming from Los Angeles that drive to Plant 42. Right. And if in fact there's a, a station in that area, it would certainly cut down the traffic um, uh, on the 14 going to uh, Palmdale from LA. Absolutely, and uh, there will be, and we are working closely with uh, Palmdale folks on what's called the Palmdale Transit Center, which is okay. the intention to build a multimodal a center that that will accommodate not just us, but as I mentioned, other other providers as well. It, it, since since it's going to supply people for a federal project, it might might encourage the administration uh, to ease up on us. <laughs> Brian, th this is a this is a great revision for uh, for this area, and um, uh, I can I'm. Very pleased with uh, your able your ability to have worked through this. Um, there's been a lot of time spent and a lot of uh, a lot of of uh, discussions with the, uh, the the residents in the area, and I'm hopeful that this is uh, they they're finding this a better alternative, more acceptable uh, to them. I, th I think that's true. We we certainly have uh, more work to do with other communities yeah. in the area, but but I think this is a positive step. For Great. Thank you, Brian. I have one question, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please, Henry. Yeah, yeah, Brian, I just wanted to ask you, what's the status or, or an update on the uh, Virgin line to Vegas? Sure, um, a couple of things. They, uh, you may have read in the paper, I'll start with this. You may have read uh, just last week in the paper that there has been a, uh, a bit of a separation between uh, Virgin, uh, the company itself, and Brightline, uh, who is the operating entity uh, for that um, Vegas to Victorville initial stretch. Um, I have been in contact, some of the board members asked me in briefings about what that means, and I was in contact uh, uh, further with the uh, Brightline uh, folks, and their agreement with Virgin was uh, a licensing and trademark agreement, if you will, where they were uh, sort of for lack of a better term, paying for the name uh, on the uh, on the project, uh, Virgin was not an equity partner in the project itself, and was not uh, funding any of the construction or operating elements of of that project. So, um, while they've terminated that uh, business relationship, uh, Brightline is moving forward on the construction and the uh, work of the project. I think the most recent development 
or two most recent developments in the project that are noteworthy is uh, first, uh, the state of California through the uh, California State Transportation Agency and Caltrans uh, did uh, finalize an agreement with uh, Brightline and Express West to allow for the use of right of way uh, in uh, on, along the I-15 corridor there uh, to uh, to construct and operate the train in what is essentially the median of the I-15 uh, highway, uh, median in some areas next to it and others. But that's about 130 miles in the state in the state of California side of the border. Uh, that'll be uh, there. So they've reached that deal, that right away deal with uh, with the state, and that's a, a big part of it, allowing them to move forward toward construction. The second part is they are now talking about what they call phase two uh, of that, which is uh, not just uh, considering the extension to Palmdale, but also uh, there's an interest in following the I-15 corridor uh, south into Rancho Cucamonga. I think there's substantial uh, planning uh, that still must go on with that. There'll be a, a need for a new right-of-way agreement to allow that to uh, to happen. And I think there's a lot to work through on that phase two element, but um, but the project uh, as best I can uh, read is still uh, moving forward. And again, from my perspective, uh, we are supportive of bringing uh, electrified high-speed rail into the Southern California region. And I, for me, it, it opens a lot of opportunity for uh, us and the importance of ultimately getting the Palmdale uh, area. So that, that's the best updates I have on that, Henry. I would agree with you, Brian. And they've also, as you know, made real strides on their, their financing uh, package yeah. with uh, private activity bonds, both approved by Nevada and uh, an agreement with California, I think for 600 million, which I guess you multiply it times four. So that in combination with something from the federal government, it, it appears that they're close to, if not at uh, the point where they've got all of the funding uh, identified for for the project, yeah. along with not having to deal with buying right away. So, what a deal! Yes. Yes. Um, uh, Henry, was was that sufficient, or was there any other question on that? Yeah, no, good. Thank you, Brian. But, uh, okay, uh, last uh, couple of uh, things here. I wanted to update on a couple of uh, program issues. Uh, for the board. Uh, one is um, I'm happy to uh, report that uh, just earlier this week, uh, we did conclude an agreement with Madera County uh, uh, that has us uh, fulfilling our commitment to remediate uh, construction impacts on some of the local streets and roads around our construction sites uh, in Madera uh, uh, County. Uh, and uh, uh, on the county side, they are immediately opening uh, roads uh, on which we've recently completed work at Avenue 7, uh, 10, and 15, and accepting ownership and maintenance obligations for all completed structures down there, which includes Avenue 7, 8, 10, 11, and 15. And the opening of these roads allows uh, additional work uh, to progress on our project. And the agreement also includes a commitment from the county to expeditiously uh, move an issue or needed permits to continue the work prospectively. I do want to thank both uh, Supervisor uh, Brett Frazier down in uh, Madera County and also their Supervisor Board Chair Dave Rogers for helping us get the, uh, the agreement done. We uh, meet our commitment on making sure we are meeting impacts to roads uh, and they are helping us uh, move forward on the project. The opening of some of those structures that we've recently committed allows us to commence work on parallel structures uh, that uh, we want to get to work on. So it's a uh, a, a positive for us uh, uh, through and through. Um, the second uh, program update that I wanted to provide uh, the board is, um, uh, you know, as we uh, build out the entirety of the phase one system connecting San Francisco to Los Angeles and Anaheim, uh, we have estimated that there's a need for uh, three separate maintenance of way facilities to support that whole uh, phase one system. Uh, uh, in the Fresno to Bakersfield environmental document that was approved by this board uh, some years ago, we identified and cleared the first of these sites that is just uh, south of downtown uh, Fresno. The site uh, will also contain the operational control center and a temporary train set acceptance testing and certification facility, along with training classrooms and support equipment such as simulators. Um, our regional staff is working closely with uh, uh, board member Perea 
and a group of the business and local government representatives in Fresno, known as Fresno Works, uh, to secure this site for these activities and preserve local investment of some $25 million to accelerate some of the infrastructure improvements to that site and help ready it for the future job generating uh, activities that would uh, occur there. These facilities uh, are proposed to ultimately be constructed by uh, the track contractor after that contracted is, is contract is awarded uh, and the authority is required to instruct uh, the bidders now on where those facilities will be located. So this work is important uh, work to move forward on the, uh, the program. Again, there'll be three of these facilities up and down the state. Uh, and this is uh, just the location uh, of, of, of these. So we look forward to continuing our close collaboration with the Fresno Works Group on this and so we can pr prepare the site and these facilities for the long-term uh, activity that's in, involved there. So I wanted to acknowledge uh, the work that we're doing with uh, the member Perea, the Fresno Works Group. And, uh, uh, and again, we're, our objective is to assure that uh, uh, as that site is identified, Fresno uh, helps us uh, uh, get those sites secured and uh, that they could still bring forward some uh, local money investment for infrastructure upgrades uh, to prepare those sites. So uh, that's uh, just an update on where we are with that. I expect there to be more to come in a very near future uh, on that. Uh, the last uh, issue I have is I've uh, said a couple of times now, and I think I mentioned to the board, uh, even in prior uh, conversations that uh, we do have a very busy uh, September board meeting uh, that will require us to do some additional briefing time with board members. Uh, most of that is gonna be centered on the uh, consideration of the supplemental EIR, EIS document for what's called the Central Valley Y. You heard about that today. But, but there are other things we'll also be bringing to the board uh, in September, including an update on the environmental schedules for all of phase one. As many of you know, and was mentioned earlier, the, uh, we, did, uh, we have delayed uh, some of these schedules for to accommodate additional uh, public uh, comment and uh, public well. input uh, uh, in recognition that COVID-19 is creating uh, some challenges for people. So on various segments, we've allocated more time for public comment. Uh, on the Burbank to LA uh, segment for which there was one a public commenter on that, uh, we have now extended that uh, a total of 45 days uh, beyond the original uh, a public comment period. That's now a 94 day uh, public comment uh, uh, a period. And I just to be clear on that, we have scheduled two additional community outreach meetings uh, in that segment. Uh, one on for August 19th, which is a telephone a town hall meeting and another one which is uh, focused on a grade separation issue an informational meeting on a grade separation that's scheduled for August 25th uh, in that area. So again, uh, we've not only added the time, but we're also uh, reaching out and, and looking to do additional community outreach uh, down there. Um, so we will update all the environmental schedules uh, for phase one in September. Uh, I'm asking our chief operating officer to prepare and we will provide a presentation on uh, the intrusion protection barrier safety requirement that is applied uh, to this project. Uh, this affects all of the CPs one through four. And I think in part because we have so many new board members, um, it's a good opportunity for all of you to understand this requirement. This is a uh, Federal uh, Railroad Administration and freight, freight rail uh, safety requirement for us to uh, build a protection barrier between the freight rails and the uh, high-speed system that we will be building. Of the 119 miles that we're constructing uh, in the Central Valley, it covers nearly 40 of those miles. So it is a, uh, a very, a sound barrier, it's got a lot to it, and it's long. And so it touches each of the construction segments and uh, it also comes with a, not a light price tag. And so uh, this has been a requirement that we've been under, I believe, since 2014. Uh, we are now finishing the designs on those and starting to move forward on the work. So we wanna do a full presentation to the board on, uh, on what those uh, look like. Uh, and then the last thing that uh, I wanna bring up at the September uh, meeting, we will uh, be discussing uh, the procurement process and options for uh, the RDP contract, which we want to start to engage the broader board on uh, discussion about options on that uh, going forward. And we will uh, begin those conversations as we head into the uh, September uh, hearing. Uh, 
that's the totality of the CEO report uh, that I have right now. I'm happy to answer any questions. And then Mr. Chairman, if there are none, there's just one other item I'd, I'd like to request, but I will, I'll take questions first if there are any. Thank you. Any questions for Brian? Um, yeah, this I, is, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, this is uh, Nancy Miller. Brian, when you come back in September, will you just have a little sheet about the public outreach and the uh, particularly outreach to communities that uh, where English is a second language and um, just to address some of the comments we've had, the, the number of times that you've extended the um, outreach or the comment period, as well as the community meetings that you've had. Yes, I'll do a, uh, I will do a, a, a full recap on the extensions of the public comment and we will cover the, uh, the extent of the, the community outreach as well. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, um, I'd like to request uh, a standing item on the agenda to update the board on the progress towards the business plan that we will uh, be adopting in December. All right, well, uh, we'll uh, I think that's reasonable, Andre. Um, it probably won't be a, a long report, but as the, as the work is being accomplished, uh, all moving towards the December uh, uh, business plan that'll be brought before the board, I think on or about the 15th. Uh, in the interim, we'll, let, we'll uh, give you a, a monthly update on where things are going in terms of, of what work's been accomplished or is being accomplished and what we're seeing and, and not necessarily what we're seeing, but in terms of um, the work that uh, still needs to be done and how all of it will be integrated into the business plan. What one of them, one of the the prime goals of that of this is to get the business plan into a in a into a draft uh, form that the board has plenty of time to review it in advance of that board meeting. So you've uh, not only been briefed, but you've had adequate time to really delve into it and ask whatever questions of management and staff that you may have in advance of it coming before the board. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I am happy to incorporate that into the CEO report beginning in September and, and onward. Yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a good place for it, Brian. I, I would like to add, if at all possible, a friendly amendment to that update for business plan. I'd like to remind the board that the reason why the business plan was even extended until December was because the legislature and the governor and, and, and the authority agreed to that extension until December, but it was predicated on certain assumptions. The first assumption was that number one, a promise was made to to uh, Assembly Member Frazier as well as Assemblywoman Laura Friedman that uh, an independent review of the ridership data would be done. And so, I would really, would really, would love to see sooner rather than later as to what steps have been taken to uh, to get that independent analysis of ridership data. I'm beginning to see the more I I, I get steeped into these issues of high-speed rail, their ridership data impacts obviously everything, the whole entire fiscal stability of this project. And um, I would just like to um, really encourage that we come up with, with steps towards number one, having an independent assessment of that. Number two, ensuring that the legislature is keenly aware of what we're doing. You know, because I don't want to hear from them. I don't want to hear from them that we don't do this, we don't do that. Let's just right away on behalf of transparency, give them all the information as well as include them in the discussion of, of, of identifying an independent reviewer to assess this data. So I would like to find out what steps we've taken towards that effort and really would like to find out about that sooner rather than later. I, I'm happy to report on that. Um, I will verbally tell you that uh, we have worked with the uh, independent peer review group um, on identifying uh, uh, firms that can take on uh, that work. And we are starting the con uh, contracting to bring them on uh, to conduct the review. And I'll give you a more a formal update of exactly where that stands, either before or at the September uh, hearing, whatever you prefer. But we are taking steps to have that review uh, done. And um, I'm happy to update uh, you on that, uh, all the board members and uh, uh, our legislative friends as well. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear you say that you're keeping the legislature informed about this, 
and also adding to the comments that Nancy Miller made about outreach mm -hmm. and working with our with our communities, especially English language um, um, bilingual communities. Let's just make sure that we also work with our legislative allies in those communities because they more than likely than not will have a keen, keen uh, temperature of the, of the community. They would know who to reach. They would know who are truly the leaders. And if we reach out to them at this level, you know, we basically buy obviously, you know, friends in the legislature, which we need. Yeah. Good Carson, point. You're making all very good points. And, and we, as you're, as you're aware, we've made the commitment to the leadership in the legislature that we are going to keep them advised during this process. They probably are not hearing as much yet as they will as the, as we move through the fall, and that's simply because we don't have we don't have reports at this point done. But what we do not want to do is is move into next year with them having not been apprised of what's going on, what the results have been, what the decisions that we're making, and why we're making them. Um, we're not we are going to do the same thing that we should be doing with everybody. Live up to our commitments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have some Mr. other questions, but I'll wait till, till Mr. Wait. Mr. Chair, going back to my idea of having a standing item as opposed to the CEO report is that we have information submitted specifically regarded, regarding that item because the CEO report doesn't really have a lot of detail beforehand. So it's a, it's a way that we can look at the information and digest it as well. Okay. I, I definitely support that. Is that a motion? Yes. Well, Second. I think, <laughs> let, let me do this in, in, fair, in fairness to making sure that we get something put together that, that is satisfactory to the board. Let, let, me, let, me, let me do a little bit of research and respond to, to both, both of you um, and give you an idea of where, where we're going to go and how we, how we can handle this. But I, I, I'd rather not shoot it off the top of my head if you would, if you would give me that for, at this point. Of course, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Chairman, if there's, I'm sorry. If there's no other questions, I just have one other request. Sure. Um, and this is a little bit on the somber side, so I apologize for that. But um, I, I did I did want to make a request today that uh, today's hearing uh, adjourn uh, in the memory of Mr. Frank Withrow. Uh, Mr. Withrow is a respected, was a respected educator in Sacramento uh, for 34 years, and uh, the husband of Karen Massey Withrow, who uh, many of you may know as the voice of High Speed Rail in our project videos uh, that we put out uh, from time to time. Um, Mr. Withrow worked as a teacher and administrator in the Sacramento City Unified School District uh, for 34 years. Uh, his, in his classroom at McClatchy High School, he inspired students beyond the classroom, had a lasting impact. Uh, it was evident just recently when hundreds of his students showed up for a drive-by parade at his home in the Elk Grove. Um, Mr. Withrow's uh, memory will continue to live on through his many accomplishments and written works. He founded and worked as director of the C.K. McClatchy High School African American Cultural Exchange Program. Uh, the program continues today. It's uh, designed for high school students to mentor younger students and teach their rich culture uh, to the world. Uh, so I just wanted to note that uh, Frank Withrow was a, an award-winning educator who positively impacted generations of, of students in the Sacramento region and beyond. And it is with uh, deep sympathy uh, from us, goes out to the uh, entire Withrow family, especially uh, his wife, Karen, who is a valued member of the High Speed Rail Authority family. So again, Mr. Chairman and uh, members, I, I simply uh, respectfully request that uh, today's uh, meeting be adjourned in uh, Frank Withrow's memory. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, let us have a moment of silence. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we will see you all next Wait, time. wait, 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 Mr. Chairman. I thought, we, did I miss the look ahead issues? I yeah. think so. Did you have a look ahead? I'm sorry, Martha. Did you have a look ahead issue that you've already talked about, uh, Brian? I, I, have to, I have two more. Oh. Um, one of them, I've already spoken to Brian about this, and that is the situation involving the 
the uh, self-review of WSP to determine if their work culture is a nice one or not. And that is in terms of identifying a safe work culture so that employees feel comfortable coming up and, and, and have their say and not, and not be fearful of retaliation. So uh, I was wondering if we were ever going to get a, a, an official report from WSP with regard to uh, uh, what they were going to do or what did their independent assessment actually you know, uh, concluded. And I'm not too sure how independent it is when you hire, when you hire a law firm to basically you know, uh, assess oneself. But um, I think we need to have a discussion of that. It doesn't have to be right now, but maybe for the next meeting. And then the other issue that I want to have a discussion about is about this troubled bridge uh, off of Route 27. And uh, I'm just very concerned. And I know that it's being remediated, so I'm grateful for that. But I want to prevent this in the future. And I'm, hope and I'm hoping that, you know, number one, I would like to find out if there are any trouble situations that we have in the construction arena. I don't mean to micromanage the construction experts, but I really would love to find out about this earlier rather than reading a newspaper or rather than preparing for a bad newspaper story. The sooner I get that information, the more comfortable I will feel. Um, and obviously, you know, I think that we need this type of early notification in order to really uh, be able to, to dutifully uh, accomplish our oversight authority. Um, I, I told you, Mr. Chairman, that I don't want to micromanage, but at the same time, I still have oversight authority, which eventually leads towards my fiduciary obligation as a board member. So those are the two issues that I would like to, you know, put on the table to discuss. doesn't have to be right now, and I think the time has already passed. So can you just please put a note that we can discuss this maybe at the next meeting? I've got, an, I've got it down here on a sheet of paper, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you, everybody, and uh, please be safe. Uh, the meeting is uh, adjourned. Um, again, our our feelings go out to, uh, to our, our lost. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Everybody, please be safe. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you. Everybody.